Oh, all yeah. right. Peace. Here we are. Love. Oh, science. yeah. Here we are. Hi, folks. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Hi, folks. Welcome to another. Oh, good. Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Otherwise, I'd be wondering if I was actually even here. I am heard, therefore I am. I exist. All right, folks. Good afternoon. Let's have a little fun with some funky science for the next hour or so, for the next funky hour. I'm going to start off, as always, with our funky science story on the song. Children, pull up a chair, my friend. Let's all get together for the story that never ends. How do we get here? What's inside your head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Gather around my people, all children, young and old. Pull up a seat, put up your feet for the greatest story ever told. Funky science story hour, cause science is knowledge and knowledge is power. Cause the world is so weird, and weirdness is fun. To learn, and we've all just begun. Oh, we can learn together, we can understand the weather, we can imagine ourselves in any place, we can see the earth from outer space. Huh? Oh, we science. and now I would smash my guitar. But I don't want to do that. I love my guitar. I love this guitar. I would never hurt it deliberately. I don't know what Pete Townsend was thinking. He was just trying to show how crazy music can make you. Which it can, but still, I would never smash my guitar. Hey! Hey, Jeb. Hey, Carmel. Hey, Jen. Um... That's not quite true, Jen. You said, Jen Mandela says, this is my favorite hour of the week. I don't need to be a kid to love science. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's the kid in you that does love science. I mean, what is a kid anyways, right? A kid, I guess, chronologically in terms of age, the number of times you've orbited around the sun. You could define a kid that way. But you could also define it as just an ad 
attitude that we all have within us of just uh, being open to the world and seeing it with fresh eyes every day and being excited by things and being open to learning and knowing that we don't know everything and that there's always so much more to learn and uh, greeting the world with an open mind and an open heart, right? Then uh, maybe uh, there, there's, a, there's, there's a kid in all of us, right? Right? So, um, so all kids are welcome here to Funky Science Story Hour. Old kids, young kids, kids with funny hats. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Sometimes the machines are, um, are wacky. Today. Awesome. We got sight. We got sound. What about smell? Can you guys smell me? Yes. Stacy said yes. I'm sorry about that, Stacy. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to fix that for next time. No, wouldn't it be cool if there were other senses uh, on video other than just um, sight and sound? Oh, well, you say that, Bonnie, but I was thinking about the fact that my dog does not respond at all to like FaceTime and uh and, and other uh kinds of screen things he'll hear the voice and he'll look at it and then he'll go and eh, no that's not real and he'll walk away but could you imagine if you were able to have smell of vision then uh like other species would be like so into it um dogs uh, maybe you uh, you would have to be able to turn it off if you hadn't had a shower you know just like you can turn off your video for a meeting if you're not dressed you could have smell of vision but you definitely have to have a mute button um so that you could turn off smells or it could be really gross speaking of the planet uranus oh okay milos we're gonna get to we're gonna get to you in a minute milos but i gotta finish this awesome question from naomi and jude in fact let's just start this again i'm gonna play naomi and jude's question again and then we're, now that we got the technical things rolled out um yeah that's true dogs would love it if you didn't shower okay let's take do this take two here's naomi and jude Yeah. Okay. Good question. So anyways, long story short. So all the planets are orbiting the sun. They're tilted to some degree. The ones that are tilted more have more season, have stronger seasons. That's why partly why Venus doesn't have seasons because it's not really tilted. Earth is tilted 23 degrees and the planet Uranus is tilted basically completely sideways, like 90 degrees. So that it's really weird. So that as it orbits the sun, half of the year, part of the year, it's only the north side that is facing the sun. And then the other part of the year, it's only the south side that's facing the sun. So it's tilted completely on its side. And it's the only planet that's completely tilted sideways. So the question that Naomi and Jude had was what happened to Uranus to make it tilted on its side? And it's a great question. And we think we know the answer. And the answer has to do with, remember we talked about the birth of the planets, the origin of the planets, what made the planets happen? How, how, how did the planets get here originally? And we talked about how it's something called accretion. And accretion means just little things smashing together to make big things, right? So the planet started off as just little dust grains orbiting the sun. And then some of those little dust in, in a big cloud around the sun and some of those little dust grains stuck together and made bigger dust grains and they were all orbiting the sun. And some of those bigger dust grains stuck together and made bigger ones and they stuck together and made pebbles. And then you had pebbles or, orbiting the sun and all those pebbles, smashed into each other and made little rocks. And then they got into bigger and bigger things as they collided and stuck. This is what we call accretion, the origin of things by things hitting and smashing together. And then you finally got to the point where you had little planets, what we call planetesimals. Remember that? We talked about planetesimals, the little planets. And the little planets, the planetesimals were, you know, 100 miles across, 500 miles across, still 
pretty little for planets. And they kept on orbiting and smashing together and colliding. And some of those collisions, they would merge and make bigger pieces. Well, finally, you got to the point where you almost had the planets that we have today. Big planets, thousands, tens of thousands of miles across. And then the final stage of that, the final stage of that where you had some collisions between planets themselves, Earth got smashed by a planet and that's what made the moon. We talked about that. In the very end when there were still still some pretty big planetesimals around, they were smashing into the planets and they did things to some of the planets. Earth got hit and made its moon. And we think what happened was that Uranus, when it was almost finished being born, it was orbiting the sun and another planet hit it. Boom. And hit it just right so that it knocked it on its side. Boom. And then it kept orbiting and spinning, but now it was knocked, whoa, it was knocked on its side. So we think, we don't know, but what we think is that happened to Uranus is that when it was being born, there was a big collision with another planet when it was young and it got knocked on its side. And that I think, Naomi and Jude, is the answer to your wonderful question, which is what hit Uranus and made it on its side? Great question. Thank you for that. Yes, I know. Everyone's got Uranus jokes running through their minds. That's okay with me. I don't have a problem with that. Don't Just don't get me started, okay? Now, Milos has a last-minute question. I love last-minute questions as long as I see him. Ooh, what's your favorite scientific discovery? Oh, man. Oh, that's so hard. Your favorite, like to just pick one is so hard because there's, I, I could, it's easier to tell you 10 than one. It's like saying, what's your, what's your favorite band or what's your favorite song? I mean, there's like a, a whole bunch of them come to mind because there's so many that I love. But I'll tell you one that pops into my head, Milos, that maybe is my favorite because it's a discovery that's happened very recently that really changes. Uh, the way that we think about everything, really. And that is the discovery of what we call exoplanets, planets around other stars. So as you know, our solar system consists of the sun and the planets orbiting it um, that we've talked about a lot. And then also some other stuff, um, asteroids, comets, and then outside of our solar system, there are all the other stars in our galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. And they're much, much, much farther away than any of the planets that we can see. They're so far away that for most of history, we did not know if any of those stars had their own planets orbiting them. We thought they probably did because we learned that the stars are just like our sun. We learned to make observations of the stars with telescopes and with uh, what we call spectrometers that let you see the wavelengths of light so you can tell what the stars are made out of. And they're made out of the same stuff as our sun. And we learned that, I mean, mostly the same stuff. And we learned that, that, that our sun is a typical star in a lot of ways, that they're not that different. Um, and so, we also learned that when our sun was young, it formed planets by the process of accretion that I was just talking about. That when the sun was born, part of what, what happened, the sun was born out of a collapsing cloud of dust and gas. After the sun was born, that cloud was left over spinning around the sun, and then it congealed and accreted and made planets. So we learned that a star like our sun makes planets as part of what happens when, when the sun is born. It should also make planets, that you should get planets. At least that's what we thought. So we thought that all the other stars should have planets out there, but we could not find them because the stars are so far away and planets are small compared to stars and they don't shine with their own light. We only see the planets because they reflect the sun's light. The sun shines with its own radiation because 
it's burn it's it's got nuclear reactions inside hydrogen burning into heliums it's bright has its own light but the planets don't shine they just reflect sunlight so to find a planet around another star because they're so far away it would be like if you have binoculars and you can see some say you can see a ship out at sea with your binoculars and you can tell there's a light on that ship out at sea you can barely see it but to find those planets would be like to see a tiny little bug flying around that light you couldn't do it with your binoculars from shore unless you had really good binoculars so for the longest time we did not know if there were any planets outside our solar system if there were any planets around other stars and we really wanted to know because we asked questions like is there life out there in the universe are there other animals and plants? Are there other intelligent creatures out there? Are there aliens? And in order to know that, we would have to know if there's planets for them to live on. But we didn't know until very recently, just about now, about 20 years ago, some scientists were very clever and they figured out that you can detect planets around other stars a couple of ways. One way is that if, uh, let's see, now let's imagine now this is the sun, okay? And um, my phone is a planet orbiting that star, okay? Now, if you're looking from far away, you can't see my phone. You can't see the planet because it's too small. But if you watch the star very carefully, you might see that it's wobbling a little bit because the planet when the planet's over here, it pulls the star over there a little bit because of gravity. When the planet's over here, it pulls the star a little bit this way. So as that planet orbits the star, the star is wobbling a little bit because of the gravity of that planet. And what we learned to do was detect that that, that star was wobbling. Even though we couldn't see the planet, we could see the fact that the star was wobbling. And it could only be wobbling if there was a planet pulling it around. So that was what they learned to do. And now that we've done that, we've started to find lots and lots of planets around other stars. In fact, not only did we find some, but the more we looked, the more we saw that there are planets around other stars. And now we understand that basically all stars have planets. That's a revolutionary discovery that's happened recently in my lifetime. And uh, maybe not in yours if you're uh, just 11 years old, but it's, it's very, very recent. And we're still trying to understand what it means. But what it means is that there's, there's lots of planets everywhere in the universe. We didn't know that. All we knew was that the only are a small, the handful of planets in our own solar system, the ones you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and all the other asteroids and comets in our solar system. And that was all. And then we knew there were other stars out there. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if there were planets? But how could we ever know? How could we find out? But then with science, sometimes you have people get very clever and you find a new way to get the answer. And you can't see the planet, but you can see the fact that the planet is making the star wobble. And then you net recently we found out that you can also see when the planet comes in front of that star, it dims the light a little bit. Just like if you were watching that, uh, that ship out at sea with your binoculars and you saw that light dim a little bit, maybe you could figure out there were bugs flying in front of that light if you had a really, really, really precise way to measure the light dimming a little bit. And we've been able to do that too. So now we have a few different ways. And we know that when you look up at the night sky, all those stars have planets. There are planets everywhere. And to me, I love that discovery, Milos, because it means that when I think about, as an astrobiologist, when I think about the question of whether there might be aliens out there, I think, well, if there are enough places out there, then life is something that's probably happened on some of those places. 
but if there aren't any planets out there, there's not going to be life. So now we know there are lots and lots of places, lots and lots of planets. So that to me means, okay, there's so many planets. There's billions and billions and billions and trillions and trillions and trillions. And that tells me that on some of them, there's probably life out there. So to me, if I had to pick one favorite scientific discovery, Milos, it would be the fact that now we know there are planets around stars everywhere in the universe, something we never knew before. Oh, haha, -ha, Lauren from Maine, seven years old, wants to know, how can we tell if a planet has life? Oh man, Lauren, I love that question. It's a great question. How can we tell if a planet has life? Um, you know, that's one of the central questions that people like me, astrobiologists, that we think about. Um, because you can't assume, if you're looking at another planet and you're looking for life there, you want to know if it has life, you can't assume that life there is going to be just like life here. You can't just go to that planet and say, well, let's look for, see if there's any elephants or palm trees or people or dogs, because life somewhere else might not evolve the same forms. In fact, you, you can be pretty sure it wouldn't evolve exactly the same forms as life here because evolution is so random. It's going to, you know, if you went back in, back in time on Earth 100 million years ago, uh, you wouldn't see human beings and uh, you wouldn't see dogs, you'd see their ancestors, you'd see other species, but you wouldn't see them. So you can't look for the same stuff we see here on Earth. And even on a chemical level, if you think about the, the cells, we talked about cells and how all life is made out of cells and those are, have these chemical machinery that we talked about with proteins and DNA, that's how life works here. But do we know that life works the same on another planet? No, we don't. So what do we look for? Um, this is something astrobiologists think about a lot. And we don't have one perfect answer, but we have some ideas that we've come up with. Um, and, and by the way, Lauren, we still need help with this. So when you grow up, if you want to become an astrobiologist, uh, this is a, a, a question I think we'll still be working on then and 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 so uh you you should consider that because we need your help but here's what we do we think about what does life do to its environment as far as we understand it all living things affect their environment like you affect your environment you're breathing in oxygen and you're breathing out carbon dioxide and you're eating various foods and then some of that matter that you eat, you poop out and you uh, your poop goes somewhere, hopefully somewhere far away in the sewer system. Um, and um, but you affect your environment and all species, all creatures affect their environments, even little bacteria, the little single celled organisms we talked about, the, back, the life that's so small you can't even see it, which is all over the earth. They do the same thing. They have to eat something. They excrete something, which is the same as pooping. They, you, they take in matter and they put out matter and they take in energy and, and they change their environment. They breathe in gases. They, uh, gas, they, they uh, excrete gases. So all life changes its environment. In some ways, we've learned to understand. They change the chemistry of their environments. So when we go to a planet, say Mars or um, some, of the, uh, some of the other planets in our solar system, or we look at an exoplanet around another star with a telescope, and we look at what its atmosphere is made out of, and we say, we want to know if there's life there. We look at the chemistry, and if there's something that's changing the environment that we don't understand, it seems like there's something there that's not just volcanoes and weather, but some other process changing the chemistry of the planet, then that might be life. So that's one thing we look for is the chemical effect, the way that life changes its environment. The other thing we can do, of course, is go when we can go to a planet like Mars with rovers, we have cameras and even microscopes. 
And the idea is if you actually were able to pick up a sample that had life in it and look at it with a microscope, you might see the forms of the cells. If you Certainly if you were an alien and you came to Earth and you scooped up some dirt and you looked at it with a microscope, you would see cells of, of, of bacteria and organisms that do not look like other things in that dirt. The shapes, the shapes of biology are organized in a way that other shapes, that other things in nature aren't. So the forms of life are distinct. The chemistry of life is distinct. And the effect that that life has on its environment is distinct. I mean, one way to think about your, your, your question, Lauren, is imagine you were an alien coming to Earth and you had never seen Earth life before. And maybe you're different from Earth life. You're made out of different chemicals. You have a different shape. And you're coming to Earth and you say, well, I want to know if this planet has life. What would you notice about Earth that would tell you that our planet has life? Well, the first thing you might notice, even from a distance with your telescope and your spectrometer, is that Earth's atmosphere is weird compared to other planets with atmospheres. It has all this oxygen. Why does Earth have all that oxygen? Because of plants and trees that are taking the carbon dioxide and the water on Earth and doing photosynthesis, which means they're using solar energy to make food. And they're breaking up those molecules and putting out oxygen. So the reason why Earth has all this oxygen in its atmosphere, which is very different from the other planets, Mars and Venus don't have all that oxygen. Our planet has a weird atmosphere. And it has a weird atmosphere because of what life does to the air on Earth. So one thing, uh, if you were an alien astrobiologist looking at Earth, you'd say, oh, the atmosphere, that's a clue. We think there's life here. And then if you actually came closer to Earth, you would see there were forests, which have a color which is different from rocks. And then you get closer and you'd see trees have this shape, this branching shape. Um, and a sh kind of shape that you just don't see in nature that's not in a living thing. And then if you uh, landed on Earth with a rover and started driving around, you would see animals walking around and birds flying through the air. And you would say, whoa, those are not rocks. You would notice the shapes and the behavior of these organisms were just very different from other things in nature that are not alive. So as you explore that planet further, you would see chemistry and shapes and behavior that would tell you that there is life on Earth. And those are the same kinds of things that we can look for on other planets. It's a good question, Lauren. We don't have a very, we don't have a perfect way to approach it because we're still trying to understand what life is and how life might exist on other planets. It's something we're, we're still trying to wrap our, our heads around. But this is uh, this is the the way that astrobiologists think about it. Great question, Lauren. Let's see. Oh, uh, Liam from Wisconsin, twelve years old. Hey, Liam. Wants to know what do you think? I think meaning what do I think is the probability of life occurring on a given habitable planet? Oh, that's such a good question, Liam. Um, what do I think is the probability of life occurring on a given habitable planet? Okay, so first of all, he used the word, the term habitable planet. What we usually mean by that is a planet that has the right conditions where life could form. So uh, we can argue a little bit about what those conditions should be, but we mostly think about liquid water on a planet. And we talked about this before, but because life, at least the kind of life we know, needs liquid water, the chemistry of life, the organic molecules that make life, they're floating around in water. And it's the floating around in water that lets those chemicals get together with that dance, that magical dance that, that allows life to happen. So as far as we know, life needs water. So that's what we usually mean by habitable planet. And there's some other things we, you know, we sometimes uh, consider. But, but the question was, if you have a habitable planet, a planet where life could happen, then what do I think is the probability of life occurring there? It's a great question because you can imagine that maybe there are habitable planets out there that don't have life. Places where the conditions are perfect, where there's liquid water, 
there's organic molecules, there's energy, all the things you need for life, but it just never happened. Maybe it's random and, and you need some, some lucky event where the right chemicals get together in just this right random way and then go, poof, we're a living cell. Wow, then maybe it's very rare. We don't know the answer, but we do have some clues about it. And one clue is that what we've learned is that on Earth, the origin of life, the beginning of life happened very quickly once there were habitable conditions. So if Earth is four and a half billion years old, roughly, um, here, let me go to the, let me go to the magic uh, screen here for a second and put Mars down over here. Um, if um, this, let's make a timeline here. Can you see that? I think you can. Um, if this is zero, when the Earth was zero years old, the beginning of the Earth, the origin of the Earth through that accretion, that smashing together of pieces. And then this is now, which is 4.5 billion years later. The Earth is 4.5, four and a half billion years old. That's a long time. So now let's say this is 1 billion. Oh, that's too small. Well, I got my funky eraser here. All right. That's 1 billion years. That's 2 billion years. That's 3 billion years. That's 4 billion years. And then 4.5. This is now. This is the whole timeline of Earth history. That's a lot of time. And when we say... Let's look and see when Earth form, when life formed, and we go back in time, and we find fossils that are more than three billion years old, and then we find other evidence, chemical evidence, that life probably formed close to here, four billion years ago, or when the Earth was only a billion years old, or even less. So the thing is, Earth probably was not a habitable planet when it formed. Earth probably became a habitable planet around here about a billion years ago because for that first billion years, there were asteroids crashing in from space all the time. Just because, remember, we talked about the Earth being formed by accretion, by things smashing together. Well, that smashing was still going on for the first billion years. There were a lot of big asteroid impacts happening. So it wasn't a good place for life until that smashing and crashing of asteroids and comets settled down. And that probably took until about here. And so the thing is, as soon as Earth became a habitable planet, life started almost instantly. We're still trying to understand the early history of the Earth. But as far as we can understand, life happened almost exactly when it could. As soon as Earth became habitable, Earth had life. So that seems to be a clue. That tells me that a planet with habitable conditions is going to instantly form life, that maybe it's not all that rare in the universe. So we don't know for sure. It's a great question. The, the way we'll answer that, Liam, ultimately is by going out and exploring and seeing what how many habitable planets there are and seeing how many of them have life. If I'm right, if what I just said is right, and it's my opinion, it's it's a educated guess. It's an informed opinion, but it doesn't mean I know the answer because we won't know the answer till we go out and explore. But if I'm right, then every time we find a habitable planet, or almost every time, it should have life. If I'm wrong and life is more sort of special or accidental or lucky, then maybe we'll find a lot of habitable planets that don't have life. That's something that we we uh, need to uh, go out and keep exploring to learn. Oh, okay. So uh, Kian, ten years old from New York City, Kian Kian, is curious about the difference between physical and chemical changes. What are some examples, and why is it important to get the difference? Oh, that's so cool. 
That's a great question. What is the difference between physical and chemical changes? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. We talked before about molecules, right? And what a molecule is and how that, that when we look at matter in the universe, it's made out of atoms and the atoms are formed into molecules. The atoms are elements and, and they combine together to make molecules. And the molecules are the things that give give things their character. It's why, um, you know, this guitar is made out of wood and that wood is made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. Just like my skin is made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. So why do they look different and feel different? It's because they're made out of different molecules. So those elements are combined in different ways. And we talked about, uh, remember, I think here's a molecule like H2O, right? So H2O, you can write it like this, two hydrogens and an oxygen. That's water, right? But if you draw a picture of it, then you've got a big oxygen atom and two little hydrogen atoms. Now, Let's talk about a chemical change or a physical change that can happen to that molecule. If there's a chemical change, it means that you're taking those atoms and you're breaking apart that molecule and rearranging them into other molecules, okay? So for instance, if we take that H2O and we wanna break it up and make oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, which you can do, that's called, we call that electrolysis. And it's, you can break up water with, with electricity and make hydrogen and oxygen gas, which then you can combine and burn and make it back into water. So if we do that, that's chemistry. It's chemistry when you're breaking apart the molecules and making new molecules. So if I take the, some of these water molecules and I break them up and instead I'm gonna make H2 and O2, then those are different molecules. You've got two hydrogens joined together in an H2 molecule, hydrogen molecules, or you've got two oxygens joined together in an oxygen molecule like we have in the atmosphere. So those oxygen molecules in the atmosphere that we're breathing, it's the same, the oxygens are exactly the same as the oxygen in this H2O, this water. But with chemist, chemical changes, Kian, you're breaking those bonds, you're breaking apart the molecules and you're combining the, the atoms, you're breaking the atoms up in the molecules and you're combining those atoms into new molecules, H2 or O2, that's one example. And everything, um, when you burn something, that's chemistry, you're oxidizing it. Uh, when you eat food and you digest it, you're taking the chemicals in that food and they're getting broken up into your stomach and combined into different chemicals, which then go into your cells and help you live. That's all chemistry. So whenever you're taking molecules and breaking them up and rearranging the atoms into new molecules, that's a chemical change. But now let me give you an example of a physical change. And this is one we also talked about in an earlier Funky Science Story Hour. And that is when something changes phase from a liquid to a solid to a gas. So let's take water again, the example of water. And we talked about this before, but if you've got water molecules, let's say you've got a bunch of them here, and they can be in a solid, that's ice and the molecules are sitting there and they're vibrating like this next to each other and they're, they're, they're vibrating in place, but they're not really floating around. They're stuck where they are in a crystal. That's a solid. We talked about that. That's ice where you have water molecules and they're sitting there, they're, they're vibrating, but they can't really move away from each other. They're just kind of stuck moving next to each other. Like if you're at a concert and you have to sit down and you're grooving music and the person next to you, you're bouncing, around but you can't really get up and dance that's those molecules are like that they can't get up and dance because they're in a solid but 
Now, what happens if we melt that ice? Then these molecules are free to start moving around. And you have, there's H2O over here, and there's one over here. And they're sliding around inside that container of water. And they're not stuck next to each other anymore. So ice is very different from water, right? So it's melted. It's gone through a phase transition. But that's not a chemical change, Kian. It's a physical change because the water is still in water molecules. It's still H2O. The H2O molecules are behaving differently and they're not stuck there dancing in their seats next to each other. Now they're getting up and they're running around. They're, they're uh, in the mosh pit and they're dancing around and they're, they can move and they can run around and they can collide, but they're not stuck sitting next to each other. So that's now gone through a physical change from a solid where they're stuck in place to a liquid where they're moving all around. They're still stuck in that container of water like this. This is liquid and the water, notice it's not moving all around the room. It's still stuck in the container. But you can have another phase transition where if the water evaporates, if it boils and becomes a gas, then it's still H2O. It's still water molecules, but now it's not even stuck in the container. It doesn't have to stay in the glass. It can go flying all around the room when it's a vapor. So it's, it's still, now they're flying up into the air and everywhere bouncing around the walls, but there's still H2O molecules. You still have an oxygen and two hydrogens. So there's no difference in terms of chemical, there's no chemical change from this solid where the H2O is bound together to the liquid where they're moving all around to the gas where they're zipping everywhere. That's... Uh, th there's still H2O, the molecules are the same. That's what I got for you, Keon, as far as the difference between physical and chemical changes. Let's see, I got another song I wanna do. Ooh, look at this, I got my favorite pick, check it out. See that? Taylor Swift, 1989, guitar pick. You might not have thought I was cool before you saw this, but now you know the answer to the question. Is Dr. Funky Spoon cool? Well, he has a Taylor Swift 1989 guitar pick. Say no more. With all this shelter in place and being stuck at home, I don't know about you, but I'm going a little bit <whistles> cuckoo. So, so I just wanted to play this song, the cuckoo. But she but never, never follows cuckoo till the 4th of July. July. Well, I played cards down in England, and I played cards down in Spain. Gonna bet you. $40, gonna beat you the very next game. Hey, lady, lady, lady. Jack of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds, I know you are old. You rock me. All my money, money, money. All my silver, all my gold. La 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 la. Oh, she's a pretty bird, and she's 
she wobbles as she flies, but she never bothers to do till the fourth day of July. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what are we doing now? Funky Science Story Hour. Milosh, age 10, almost 11. Milosh wants to know what special properties life on Mars would need to survive. Yeah. What? That's a good one. Such an interesting question, Milosh, because um, we don't completely know the answer. I, I know I keep saying that to these questions, but it's, you just got to be honest about this. You know, we have some ideas we're working on and some hunches. And of course, we're going to Mars to, to look for locations where we think we might be able to find life. So the challenges for life on Mars, let's imagine if we're first, if we're talking about, if we're talking about life on the surface of Mars today at least on Earth, it needs liquid water, and it's made out of carbon molecules, uh, organic molecules, which is a lot of, you know, we talked about, I talked about molecules. So most living things, most living things are made out of molecules that have a lot of carbon and another carbon and then yet another carbon and yet another carbon and yet another carbon. And yeah, there's other things. There's oxygens and hydrogens and nitrogens and whatever, but the backbone, the basic chemistry of life is chain lots and lots of carbon molecules. That's what I'm made out of. That's what you're made out of. That's what your cat is made out of. That's what the bacteria living inside the gut of your cat are made out of. That's what the viruses infected bacteria living inside of the gut of your cat are made out of. I mean, I don't wanna gross you out, but it's all carbon. So we don't know for sure, but when we talk about finding life elsewhere, we kind of assume that it's going to be made out of these big carbon molecules and it's going to need water. So that presents a couple of problems for life on Mars, because as we talked about on the surface of Mars, there isn't really water, liquid water. And there's all that really powerful radiation and ultraviolet radiation coming down from the sun which is gonna rip apart molecules. Like on Earth, we're lucky because the ultraviolet light from the sun is mostly blocked in our atmosphere by the ozone layer. So we don't have too much of it. But on Mars, there's no ozone layer. You have a much thinner atmosphere. Uh, there's strong radiation, which is sterilizing the surface. And there's no liquid water. So if you were going to be an organism trying to live on the surface of Mars, one special property, you would have to have a way of getting water probably from the air. There is water vapor in the air of Mars, not a lot, but there's a little bit. So you could imagine that the, these Martian creatures would have some way of getting water, maybe from the air or from the rocks. So they'd have to have some way of getting water and then they'd have to be able to hold on to that water inside. That would be one special property. Another special property was they'd need some way to screen out that radiation from the sun. So maybe they'd have some kind of special shell or some kind of uh, what we call a membrane, some outer covering that would have something in it that would serve as a, like a super powerful sunscreen. You know how you put on sunscreen when you go out in the sun because you don't wanna get too much sunlight, which will give you a, a, a sunburn um, or even cancer in the worst case. So you you try to, that sunscreen, that's what you're doing is you're blocking the ultraviolet radiation from the sun so that it won't hurt your skin. So on Mars, any life would need a much more powerful sunscreen. So me, Martian organisms have like a, a, a natural sunscreen. Um, so, so you need special properties. You need to be able to hold water somehow. You need to be able to screen out the radiation. Those are the main things. But the other thing, if I were going to try to live on Mars today, I think about living underground. 
because underground there's not radiation because rock and dirt you go down a, a you know a few feet underground and most of that radiation is getting blocked out by the rocks and the dirt and also if you go deep enough underground on mars you're you're probably going to find liquid water because we know there's ice on the surface of mars and so if, if 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 life was living on the surface of mars it would have to find some way to melt some of that ice to make water for itself but under underground on mars if you go deep enough it's going to be hot enough because planets always get hotter as you go towards the inside. So if you go deep enough on Mars, you're going to find liquid water. So maybe the special property life on Mars would need now would just be simply being able to live deep underground. And then you'd be able to find water and you'd be able to uh, shield from radiation. Great question, Milos. Thank you for that. Peace, love, science.